same high school, man. We had a new level here. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemiroff and here is my lone co-host, Angie Han. Hello. So we are doing it just the two of us today because poor Christy missed out on the wonderful Everybody Wants Some. I kind of just spoiled our review there, but we're going to talk about the movie Everybody Wants Some. But to start off, we're going to hit a hot topic about Angie's experience seeing Batman v Superman again in... 4, 4DX, that's what this thing is called? Yes, it's called okay. 4DX. Uh, so if you listened to our episode last week, you know that I'm the one person in the maybe the entire world that liked Batman v Superman colon Dawn of Justice. Um, but the real reason that I went to go see it in 4DX is because that shit cost $30 a ticket. And one of my friends was able to like get me get me in as a plus one for like a press event. So I did that. Uh, so 4DX, if you're not if you're not aware, is um it's I guess the best way to it, it's like it, the idea is that it's gonna put you in the movie by like having like different effects, like your seats move, like their seats are on like a gimbal so that they can like move, or like they have like you know little like things in them so that your seats will can rumble. Um, you know, there's like smell effects and like smoke and smog and like that all that kind of stuff. So it's you know you're supposed to feel like you're in the movie. That's the idea. Does Jesse Eisenberg feed you a Jolly Rancher? He does. Then not. I would pay thirty dollars for this ticket. <laughs> you would pay $30 for Jesse Eisenberg to feed you a Jolly Rancher. You know, it doesn't even have to be a movie. It's just going to be some weird, like, sex thing. Just, like, You know, I think I, like, think I might. Rangers. As long as I can request my favorite flavor, I'm in. What's your favorite flavor? Well, cherry. Oh, all Who right. doesn't like cherry, cherry Jolly Ranchers? I like watermelon. Oh, t- yeah, we're going to have to talk about this. Probably not on the podcast. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, so the idea, so the, you know, the goal of 4DX is to make you feel like you're in the movie with them, you know, so that you feel like rain when the, it's raining and stuff like that. But in my experience, it doesn't make you feel like you're in the movie because it's really distracting. It actually is really counterproductive because instead of making me feel like, oh, I'm in the movie with like, you know, Jesse Eisenberg, like riding a motorcycle in the rain, I felt like, oh, like, I would be, like, in the movie, I would be, like, in, 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 invested in the movie and watching it and, like, following it along, and then uh, suddenly just, like, something would happen, like, you know, raindrops would fall on my head, and it would just jolt me out of the movie, because it feels like you're watching a movie and someone sprayed you in the face with a spray bottle. You like, legit got wet during the rain scenes? Not a lot. It's just, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's a few drops of water, so it's not, like, you right, know, you're well, not, like, walking I'm out because that would have ruined my hair. No, no, no. It's not enough to ruin your hair. It's like literally just like a couple of drops. My bangs are super sensitive. A couple of drops could ruin my bangs. Okay, fine. Chris, or not Chrissy, Perry, you don't have to do 4DX. But um, actually, I'm I'm trying to argue that no one else should either. So like they have a lot of effects. Like, um, but for example, for example, like, you know, when there's an action scene, it smells kind of like burning rubber. And I'm like, I don't know why this is the thing that you want me to smell, but okay. And um, and then there's like a scene where there there's a scene that takes place in the ocean. So then it smells like this is the weird thing. It it doesn't smell like the ocean. It smells like someone plugged in a Glade air freshener called Ocean Breeze. Like it's like that kind of ocean. Like um, sometimes when people are getting shot in the head, you feel like a little burst of air, like you know, hitting you um, mm. in the head. And sometimes like when Batman is punching people, your seat punches you in the back. It's like really just like unpleasant and distracting. I wonder who's the person who's directing this whole experience because it seems to me like if something like that is supposed to immerse you more in the movie and what's happening that like the actual director like the filmmaker needs to be orchestrating that kind of thing. Like I feel like a Quentin Tarantino movie would be perfect for that because he's so big into you know you know with what he did with Hateful Eight kind of making it more of an experience but like the filmmaker has to be part of this. I mean, I think, I feel like that's the problem. Like, I can, I can, I think that, I think the, you know, the ideal is, is something like Star Tours, where, like, you, you're just sitting there and you feel like you're actually, like, in it. You feel like you're actually experiencing it. But the problem is that, like, you know, something like Batman v Superman, like, you know, leaving the quality of the movie itself aside, like, it's not designed for, you know, Zack Snyder didn't direct it thinking that this is how it was going to be presented. So I feel like that, I feel like you're right. I feel like that is a huge part of it. Like, it's, you know... So they're like, like maybe if someone had designed it from the ground up, knowing it was going to be in 4DX and presented that way, like maybe they could figure out a way to like incorporate things more seamlessly. But it, like, just like I, li- I like the better ride, like Star Tours is designed that same way with that mentality, like knowing what kind of ride it's going to be, and the whole thing is built around that concept. And also, Star exactly. Tours is, is what like a fifteen-minute ride versus a two and a half-hour movie. 
Exactly. So it works a lot better. I mean, like, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to be like, oh, this is never, ever, ever going to work because you don't, you know, you don't know, like, especially like with the advent of virtual reality and stuff like that, like, you know, maybe, maybe in the future, this is how this is kind of how we'll be enjoying things. But I feel like it, it feels like when you were watching, like, it feels like when 3D started to be a thing again, and you we watched so many bad 3D movies that just like made the experience way worse instead of better. Like, it kind of feels like we're at that. If if this even even if this ever actually takes off, it feels like we're in like that like really rough infancy right now. It's funny to me that we're either talking about movies not playing in theaters anymore like the whole the whole experience of going to see a movie in a theater is going away or we're talking about complicating it more like yeah. it's just the two polar opposites nothing in the middle well i think it's because they feel like you know audiences you know, like like there's especially now that people can rent stuff on itunes so easily it's a really hard to get people to actually get up and go to the theater so then they keep trying to add add more and more stuff and then the tickets get more more expensive which drives people you know more what would away. be you know what would make it more likely for me to get my ass in a theater is just like really standard movie theaters and just make them neat and clean neat and clean and comfortable done i'll come to a movie then the, the main reason why i don't like going to the movies like, and especially in public screenings and select press screenings is because they put us in, like, the dingiest theaters, like, the freaking 42nd Street bed bug situation. I mean, that's part mm. of the reason I don't want to go to certain theaters. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand, I, I guess I understand if you're, you know, like, from a financial standpoint, why they want to try the 4DX thing, because you're charging $30 a ticket, and it and it does offer you, for better or for worse, an experience that you're not going to get at home, and, you know, so a lot of curious people might just be like, I just want to try it out, but I'm just I'll saying, I'll come over like, when you're watching your next movie, and I'll shake your couch. Yeah, exactly, but I'm just saying, as someone who went, uh, I did not personally think that it... I didn't find it enjoyable. I found it to be worse than a regular movie experience and definitely not worth $30. So I guess it's less likely that you'll fall asleep during that super long movie, though, right? It is a lot less likely, yes, because okay, if you good. were going to fall asleep, suddenly there's going to be a rain scene and a few drops of water will sprinkle on your head or suddenly <laughs> your seat will just punch you in the back because Batman punched a bat guy in the back. That's like the weirdest element I've ever heard. All right, so uh, thumbs down for 4DX. Yes, don't All do right. it. Don't waste your money. Now we're going to move on to our big review of the week, Richard Linklater's latest, Everybody Wants Some. The IMDb synopsis for that one is, a group of college baseball players navigate their way through the freedoms and responsibilities of unsupervised adulthood. That is very fair, but to be a little more specific, it's about this one guy who's a star high school baseball player, and he goes, he's going to college for the first time, where he gets in with all the fresh meat there and it's kind of like the upperclassmen showing him the way at school and it takes place over the course of just three days so it's the three days before classes start and before like intense baseball practices start if I went into this because I'm obsessed with Daisy Confused a little frustrated with the idea of calling it a spiritual sequel because like what is that even we're in an age where every single thing is called like a reboot a remake a spin-off spiritual this a cinematic universe like really are we going to continue that but yeah. I mean the headline of my review out of South by was that this is a true spiritual sequel it felt like it came from the same universe as Daisy and Confused just set with a different group of guys in a different place. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it, it I, I, I don't like, I don't love it as much as Days and Confused, but it does have that same kind of like feel of just capturing a, a very specific moment in your life and capturing not just that moment, but like the way it feels when you're looking back at it and also the way it felt in that moment when you're looking forward at your point, your, at where you are in life now, if that makes sense. Like, I think mm -hmm. Richard Linklater, I think, works with time better than like almost anyone, like where he really knows how, how time works and how memory works and how like looking forwards and looking backwards work. I mean, that's kind of what drives like his before trilogy. That's, that's what made Boyhood so effective a couple years ago when that opened. And I think that this is the same thing. Like this to me really felt like it doesn't reflect my college experience. I was not a college baseball player. I know you guys are all so surprised. <laughs> um, but it does, it, it like, you know, you watch it and it does make you think about, it does make you think back to this time when you were starting out, when you first got to college and you were starting the next chapter of your life and everything in the world felt possible. Like everything felt like something that you could try. Everything felt like something you could try to do or to be. Um, and I think it captures that moment really, really well. That said, I think that one of the reasons I didn't respond to this, I mean, I really like this movie, so don't get me wrong, but I think one of the reasons that I didn't love it as much as his other ones is that it felt a little bit less naturalistic and a little bit broader than some of his other movies. My one complaint, which is why I put it a notch under Dazed and Confused, is it's, 
It was actually like a tiny bit too broy for my taste. It's like it is very no, and, broy. And, and it's, like it's normally I'm not one movie. to pick on this issue, but like there's almost no female perspective in this movie because at least dazed and confused, you know, sometimes they're all they're talking about like, oh, I want to get with the girls and whatnot. Well, but it has we like have, the Parker Posey character and like her whole like side of the movie in that one. Uh, yeah, and we get to see them kind of navigating the same situation. So you get this big picture, but from a different perspective too. Here you don't get that at all. We do, we do have one female character, Beverly, play, played by our, fa- our favorite. Deutsch. We all, we all love Zoe Deutsch very much. But um, she, I mean, she does a really good job. She shows up in the beginning of the movie and kind of disappears. I want to say for like an hour of it, and then shows up again in the third act. But she does a really good job of kind of. It's almost like all the guys in the movie are going crazy the large majority of the time, and she she pulls reins them in in the end. So it's like the perfect transition. I don't think into she reins them in. I think that it's just that she represents a, a, like some another channel of college for the main character. And I actually, I so you know, you know me. I'm usually the one that like doesn't like it when a movie doesn't seem to have any female perspective or like seems to have a female character shoehorned in. But for some reason, this one I didn't mind too much. I think a lot of that comes from Zoe Dutch's performance. Like she's just so good, and like she feels so like even though she's not in it that much, she makes. She owns the hell out of the role and makes the most yeah. of it and really makes her feel like a three-dimensional person. Reining in was probably the wrong choice of words. I mean okay, reining sorry. in in terms of, like, the like the ideas. Like, these guys are all like, let's, like, seize every opportunity and get crazy and do all this, like, nutty shit. And she kind of does it with a little more, like, a, a more narrow, realistic focus. And it kind of... It it does rein the main character in the slightest bit. Well, in the movie, she's a little bit older than him, right? Like, she's, like, a sophomore? I thought she was moving in as well. Oh, really? Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, I get... Either way, it's, like, see, I think... It's, it's I, almost like I keep wanting to write, like, every time I write about the movie, like, they're, they're you know, shenanigans on campus, but, like, are the guys even living on campus? Because they're in a house. She seems to be moving into, like, an apartment that's not I a dorm. I think that she lives on campus and they live just off campus, but I could just be projecting based on how stuff was set up at my college. Um... It, it's funny how, like, you think about because, you know, I went to NYU, so my college doesn't look like anything like any of the colleges I've ever seen oh, on the Oh, that's screen. true. Yeah, my college didn't look like that either, but, yeah. Anyway, um, I think that... I think that she's a little bit of a contrast to the guys in that, like, so the guys, like, over the course of these three days, you see them try on, like, they're always, first and foremost, baseball players or bros or who they are. But you see them kind of, but like as the movie goes on, you like each character develops a little bit more individual personality. Like when you first see them, you're just like, it's just this big mess of like loud, obnoxious bro dudes. But then you get to know them as individuals a little, little bit more. And over the course of three nights, you get to see them trying and discarding different identities. Like the first time they go out, they go out to a disco. The second time they go out, they go to like a like a country bar. And then the third time that they go out, they go to um, like a punk club. And then like at the very end of the movie, they go to like a theater party. So they're kind of like trying on different things. She seems a little bit more selfish assured and uh like more confident in who she is and how she fits into the world and I think a lot of that has to do with um she explains about like how her childhood was like she went to like a fame like high school and stuff like that so I think that I think it's in- interesting because you see the guys as these people where like the world is full of like limitless possibility about who they can be whereas she seems at the same more time they're also like tunnel vision baseball because yeah. like, a lot of them grew up as being star baseball players, and now like baseball is their identity and existence at college. But I feel like it works, because I, I do feel like college is the time where you start to see... I mean, there's there's some things about everyone that are remain the same throughout basically their whole lives, and there are some things that don't. And I feel like college is where you start to see like the differences between that, because like... You know, when you're growing up, you're just always like the one person. But college is like one of you, for a lot of people, one of the first opportunities you have to like kind of be like, well, what parts of me are like really essentially me, and what parts of me are things that I want to try to change or try to do differently or like try out new things. And that's exactly what this movie explores, but it does so in like such a subtle manner. It's not like, you know, the main guy who's his name is Jake and he's played by Blake Jenner. It's not like he comes like a like a douchebag bro who just wants to get in with the the older guys and party all the time. And then in the end, he has to be like the model boyfriend. It's just like yeah. really subtle changes that are very natural responses to what's happening around him. Another thing that really amazed me about this movie is just how you actually got to know these guys to the point that you remembered their names and you remembered like what their shtick was in the end. I didn't this, remember their names, but I did. I was surprised I remember, by how well I was able to differentiate them by the end. Because they just, all, like, 
when I was writing my review, I purposely didn't let myself go back to the IMDb because I was just curious to see how many of my favorites I remembered. And I had a much harder time remembering their real names than their screen names. I had the opposite, actually. But I mean, that's not like I'm bad with names. That's not a fault of the movies. Uh, I think that they did a really good job. So which were, which were some of your favorite characters? Like, I feel like Glenn Powell, who plays like, oh my kind God. of like... He's um, fantastic. He's a womanizer and he's like kind of a philosophizing you, kind of dude. Have you watched Scream Queens? I have not. He's got a very... All right, so Scream, this is all of Scream Queens for me, but he has a very big personality in that show. And it's like, you know, you can handle a little bit of it at a time and then you're kind of done with it. That was kind of the whole show for me, though. Here he has the same thing, but that character is, uh, he is kind of like the Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused for this movie. Like, uh, he just, There's another he, character who I think is a little bit even more like Matthew I, McConaughey. I, yeah. I know that too. No. So my favorite- I, keep, I keep hearing people compare Matthew McConaughey to one or the other, but it's something about the way that character speaks that it's it's like a mesmerizing way where I would kind of take as fact almost anything that he said. He could convince me of just about anything. <laughs> That's fair. Um, the other, my favorite character, I think, was the other one that people are comparing a lot to Matthew McConaughey's character, and that's um, Wyatt Russell plays this like slightly older um, transfer who is who who just like loves to get really stoned and like you know kind of you know and. He reminded me so much of this guy I knew in college who loved to get stoned and just like go on like these philosophical rants about like art and culture and society and stuff like that. So I, I, I immediately I loved him. Yeah. No, I liked him. I liked him a lot too. He was he was really funny. I mean, like, overall, I don't know this where cast he's. Great. I don't even know what he's been in. Really. Wyatt Russell, twenty twenty two Jump Street. Oh, twenty two Jump Street. Oh, he was in. Um, oh my God, what is that movie called? The horror remake. We are. We are, we are still here. No, that's it. Ted's movie. Oh my God, it's gonna bother me. I don't know. Whatever it was, I don't think I saw it because it doesn't sound. It doesn't ring. We a are what we much. are. We are what we are, and it is a very good movie. And he's pretty good in it, but he has a very small role in it. I just, I mean, this cast is great, and I feel like, I feel like it's, um, you know, like when you watch Days and Confused now, you're like, wow, this is like everyone in it. It's full of stars. But when he was actually first casting the movie, they weren't all big stars. And I feel no. like I could see this movie kind of being like that in like 10 years where we'll look back and be like, oh, wow, there's actually a bunch of people in there. Like Zoe Dutch, I think, is definitely headed for greater things. I thought Blake I Jenner hope, was fantastic. I would hope so at this point. I, I'm, I'm just waiting to see which, like, Star Wars or superhero thing wants to snap her up because, like, there's, they would be it's dumb not to. Yeah. I guess, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, the Glenn Powell role is probably more in line with uh, Don from, from uh, Dazed and Confused because he's kind I of like the... I don't know who fit- Don is. I'm so, he's, I don't he's like he's like the like the quick talker, and he's always given uh, he's always given Jason London's character oh, yeah, advice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I guess okay. he's more like that. But another one that I I really enjoyed was uh, Temple Baker, who plays like he's like a doofus meathead. He's one of the other freshmen. His name is Plumber in the movie, and you could probably get the sense from the film's promotional campaign because almost every single clip and trailer they've released, he's the one saying like a super doofy thing at the end of it. Like he is the one that says in the trailer, he's like, like, I want a tail or whatever. And it, it just hits the point where you think something like that would grow old, but I got so used to him giving that last one liner in moments that I kept waiting. I'm like, what nonsense is he going to say next? And like every single time he says something stupid, I was just in tears. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard a lot of uh, critics talking about is just the fact that everyone seems so surprised that they like this, like, really bro-y movie. <laughs> like, I feel yeah. like bros are getting kind of a bad rap right now, but, I mean, they're people, too. And, like, well, I mean, one of the things that, Richard, like, there are a lot of things that are about, I guess, quote-unquote, modern bro culture that are kind of toxic or, like, negative, but I, I feel like he kind of really gets at, like, like, he, he doesn't really look at that, but he, he acknowledges that they are privileged. Like, the characters kind of talk about how when you're, like, the big, you know, like, when you're, like, the star baseball player, the world just kind of falls in place around you, like, how everyone worships you. So they mm-hmm. do talk about that. It's not like it goes unacknowledged. But, I mean, he really, like, focuses on, like, the great things about, like, this kind of, like, you know, almost fratty culture where, like, it's just, like, the camaraderie, like, the really close friendships, like, the, you know, the easy... Uh, he gets he gets away with it too because he doesn't glorify it. It's not like in a a broad comedy where it's some sort of like cartoonish version of this. It's like you're on the ground and experiencing it from their perspective, and through their eyes, they are like the kings of the campus. They could do whatever they want. They could treat anybody however they want. And 
I kind of just fell into step with them really quickly. I did have a, I, I needed like, I'd say five or 10 minutes to adjust to how they behaved and what the movie really was. But once I'm like, all right, I'm with you guys. Then I was with them for the entire movie, and I ended up walking away getting something out of it. I actually, like, immediately was, like, on board. I mean, like, it's not like I, like, ran with a particularly, like, bro or fratty crowd uh, in college, but I went to, like, a really preppy school with, like, you know, lots of loud, boisterous, drunk kids. So, like, when the movie opened, I was just like, okay, I, I, I think I know who these people are. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely knew who they were. And I knew who they were in the end, but within... With, with with just enough change that I felt like everybody grew a little the entire time. And it's got they some do, really... and it's imperceptible. Like, you know, no one has, like, a big, like, oh, I had a big, I had an epiphany. A and, big like, revelation, a yeah. And, like, but you just, it just in the way that you see people change over the course of, especially, like, a formative time like college, you do kind of see them, like, subtly become more themselves, like, subtly, like, you know, evolve a little bit and sub- and like start to experience new things, and it's it feels special. But yeah, now Linklater has covered like everything. He's covered like childhood up until college. He's covered high school. He's covered college. He's I, covered like I actually you know, asked him during my junk interview years. in South by Southwest. I'm like, if you do a third of this series here, what would it be? And he said something along the lines of like the late '80s, and he referenced how the music scene changed then, and he said it would be darker. I don't know. I, it obviously he he likes to he's a talker so I wouldn't take that as like he's gonna make a third one and it's gonna be darker in the late 80s but when I when I did ask him he he had that idea came to mind pretty quickly I mean like because because when you watch when you watch this movie you you can almost sort of like the characters in this aren't like the character in boyhood but you can kind of connect it in your head of, of like you know just like a Oh, okay, so like the kid in boy, like in your in my head, it all kind of fits together. Like, oh, okay, so there was the kid in boyhood, and then he went to high school, and he was dazed and confused, and now he's like no. in this, and then like he's eventually going to become Ethan Hawke in like the before movies. I was thinking that maybe the next one could be like a first job out of college or something, you know, where that that kind of like the workforce family kind of environment. Like almost like an Empire Records, you know. <laughs> like I, I could see that. Linklater doing a, a spin on Empire Records. I would watch that, but to be fair, I'd watch Linklater do anything. So, to... I, so would I. Yeah. I am completely just anything he touches. I will. I will want. Yeah, he's one of those. He's one of those directors that as soon as his name on project, I'm like, well, that just became one of my most. You know what else movies. you should you should want, and like you in particular, Angie. They're making an everybody wants some beer through the Alamo Draft House, and we got to taste test it, and it was <gasps> free. And you know what's funny is you know. How how particular I am with beers. This was like a beer made for me. It was my kind of beer. Nice. All right. Which if basically they ever have distri- if they ever super light over here, then I'll definitely try it. <laughs> All right. So try the beer, and we both really loved. Everybody wants some. Yep. Which hit select theaters this week, correct? It hit select theaters this weekend. I think it hit like New York and LA, but it's going to be rolling out over the okay. next few weeks. So as it comes to your town, be sure to keep an eye out for this one because it, it, it is a big winner. So that is a wrap on episode 108 of Popcorn and Prosecco. You know where to find us. Go to iTunes where you can subscribe and comment and rate. And then you can go to our website, popcornprosecco.com. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at popcorn prosecco and then the two of us are all over the internet as well angie you want to go yeah uh so i'm on twitter at ajhan and i write for slashfilm.com and christy is not on this week but you can find her on twitter at christy puchko that's k-r-i-s-t-y-p-u-c-h-k-o and she writes all over the web but you can find her career highlights at decadentcriminals.com nailed it you can yes. catch me on twitter at p nemerov and then my writing is on collider.com thank you guys so much for listening and we will see you next week Bang, bang, a boogie to the boogie, say don't jump the boogie to the bang, bang, boogie, let's rock.